How do you then take your experience of change and influence the process? You know, well, I did it, you could do it. You know, it's not that scary, it's exciting. Well, maybe, but again, I think it's important to kind of reflect on, on your own uh, experience of, of therapy. So we talked about change, and this will be a little bit of a, of a didactic, if you will. We have some models of change, right? We were all trained on biological models, psychological models, the nature-nurture model. Um, you know, this one says, why can't you take responsibility for your own actions? Uh, I blame my upbringing. All right, so those of us, who, those of you who are parents have heard that a million times. The nature-nurture, okay? Models of change. We have social learning theory models of change. We do know there's, that this, is, this has been proven uh, fairly repeatedly that in a high value stimulus situation, people will start to adopt the behaviors, if not the beliefs, of the, the stimulus, the valued stimulus. And, you can, and that's, we call that mirroring, right? We've seen that. You may even do it, you may notice a, if you hold your hand a certain way uh, in the therapy, or in supervision, you may notice your supervisee starting to do something. You may notice that you do it yourself. And of course what that is, right, this is the old attachment behavior. We're trying to, to mimic, mirror, attach to the other person. That's, that's this is pretty, uh, pretty well uh, you know, validated uh, type of a, of a change. So, if you believe that, all right, Social learning theory says a behavior is observed, then copied or modeled, and the model has to be considered high value, attractive or desired, or possess something that the other person wants, okay, or values. So, we come back to that one, because that's gonna have direct implications, if you believe that, for the therapy, because then what are you in the therapeutic process? Now, if you're Freudian, you're not supposed to be anything, right? But you are something, you're another human being in that process. So we talk about the behavioral models. Now, this, particularly when we're working with adolescents, um, this can become, I think, a, a trap if we become too behavioral. Uh, I, I do think that um, you know, the, the, the art of dealing with adolescents is to balance the behavioral, setting the, the limits, setting the responses, uh, versus encouraging you know, the freedom to develop but we know that in operant and in class, in classical conditioning, rather, uh, we can become the conditioned stimulus giving the positive response. How does that occur? It occurs when the adolescent needs a letter from you to go to his PO, all right? You now have this role, okay? Operant conditioning, kind of a little bit, it, a little bit different. But same, again, it's a stimulus prompting a behavior. Of course, you guys remember, one of the criticisms of, of conditioning behavioral therapy is that it's relying on external motivators. And there's not a lot of data that um, suggests that that's been internalized. There's kind of, it's kind of difficult to, to measure that. I think they tried to do some neurophysiology on measuring stimulus internally to uh, external motivations. But again, if you believe this, this is your, your gestalt, then this will come out in the therapy, okay? This is, you know, the rat people. Uh, no, no criticism, but this is the Skinner box people. There are people out there who really believe in this. Okay, and, and there's no criticism of that. I mean, that, that's cool if that's what your thing is. So we know, remember, classical conditioning, behavior becomes a reflex response to an antecedent stimulus. As soon as you walk into the therapy session, Okay, there's some kind of a physiologic, it's, it's, it's how we, we experience white coat hypertension, right? We walk into the doctor's office and boom, we start to flutter. Well, for some of your patients, it's not that dissimilar. If you've ever done family or couples therapy with a reluctant partner, one of them is partner, and that's the one who's, oh, doesn't, dreads it, I'm gonna have to you know, say this, she's gonna ask me this. You know, and meanwhile, the other partner's thrilled to be there. You know, it's rare that they're both miserable in the therapy, in the couple's therapy. Usually one is pretty psyched because he or she ratted out the other one, you know. And then we have uh, operant conditioning. And this is very important when we start to get to that whole reward token economy world, okay. We have the cognitive theory of change. 
This is another one that you may subscribe to in the therapy. And this is actually, um, can be very effective, particularly with, with um, alcohol and other, uh, other addictions, where it's the assimilation accommodation, where you meet the person where they're at, you introduce something a little bit discrepant, just a little bit discrepant from their worldview, ask them to play with it for a bit, you know, mull it over, try it out, that's the assimilation. And then the accommodation is when they learn and expand their, um, their whole worldview and their, their repertoire of behaviors, okay? So we have reasoned action. This tends to, this is uh, a little bit newer. So unless you've been more recently in school, reasoned action is very, very rational. It's, al it's almost uh, like the cumulative property in mathematics. It's just, you know, you add this, you add this, you add this, and then you get this, okay? So you assess your feelings, you assess your ability to complete the task. So you have a feeling about being sober. You assess okay, your ability to be sober. You look at the pros and cons of engaging in sober behavior. And then you look at the social expectations. And th when you put this all together, this is really what we're asking people to do. We're asking them to kind of become someone new based on feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. Where I think we tend to live when we're dealing with um, folks who maybe uh, we, we assess that they're, they're in a, uh, an addiction because they're feeling badly about themselves, they're feeling like their life has never really given them the opportunities, you know, those kinds of things, a little bit of, of, of self-beating up, self-demeaning behavior. We try to work on self-efficacy and self-appraisal, all right? And my only caution with that is, it's more than, therapy is more than simply affirming. Uh, I, we, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the Rogerian uh, model, but therapy is more than this, this, this open tap of affirmations. It, it really is. I think we do have to teach people that they have a skill set and that you know, over the years they may not have developed that skill. I think that goes back to the diagnostics. I mean, it, you know, not everybody can do everything Okay, it's just not the way the world is. But we do have to help people understand what it is that they can do. And I, as, as I'm understanding our work at Sovereign, one of the things that I'm coming across is people need to, we need to get good diagnostic information to answer this question. What can you do? You know, what can you do? It's, life isn't, you know, uh, a, a flat line. People have skills and people have talents and people have challenges. It, it does vary, all right? So I, I want us to take, I just think this is a really interesting thing. Now, if I was teaching, if this was like a real class, this is, you would be filling this out, okay? We would, we would go through, okay, here's the case. People change when they hit bottom. Do you believe that? Do you believe that everybody who hits bottom changes? No. Right, okay. So that, that's operant conditioning. Operant conditioning says that we are motivated to avoid pain. Face down in a gutter, my wife leaving me, my bank account drained, well, then I should change, okay? If you believe that people avoid pain, then your intervention will be along those lines. Present the negative effects, ask them to you know, record and report on the negative effects, but we know that pain and fear tend to be short-term motivators, okay? People change when they are in a loving and supportive environment. Well, ask the adult child of an alcoholic, ask the spouse of an alcoholic, ask the spouse of a person who is very borderline, okay, and just can't take it anymore. So social learning and psychological theories would suggest, well, maybe they do, okay? Or people change when they have obtained insight and many of us, I was, that's my, where I was trained. Insight is, the, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's the, the, the God of change. Well, insight, I'm betraying my, my bias, insight is important because it can give you a kind of a roadmap, but it's not magic. And we all know, I, I, if I ask you your demons, 
You know, who, who wants to share a demon? No, I'm kidding. Uh, you ask your own, about your own demon, you know it. You have insight into it. People have told you about it. You've seen the effects of your own behavior. You have insight. Nobody in here is uninsightful. But what did it take to change your behavior? You know? So we know that insight may be important, but maybe not the whole thing. But again, these are your hypotheses. You'll behave in a certain way. Got to step back for a second. What do you believe about change again? Okay. People learn by practicing new behaviors that are in incompatible with the target behavior. All right? Practice. So you present the stimulus, the bar. And you tell the guy, I want you to drive past the bar every day, twice a day, to and from work, and not get out of your car. All right? It's a new behavior. This, this is a challenge. This, think, if any of you are in recovery, think about the first time you went to a social event and where there was alcohol, and you didn't take anything. All right, that's a new behavior, right? All right? People change through the presentation of punishment or fear of punishment. Well, that, that's one of the mantras, right, of, um, of adolescent uh, token economy programs that, that tend to be, that are punitive rather than reward-based, okay? If you do this, then you will pay this price, right? If you believe that about change, and you and therapy are the change agent, what role does that place you in in the transference? Okay, I mean, that's an interesting role. You're now either the teacher or the punitive parent or the gigantic superego, but you're, you're doing something that is, um, I think, going to influence the, the, the transference uh, intensely. We, we are in the process of training a cadre of staff at Sovereign whose sole goal is to encourage recalcitrant or reluctant uh, patients to go into group therapy rather than just kind of wander because they're too agitated. And, you know, one of the things we're doing is we're saying there's, there's nothing punitive about this. This is encouragement. This is, you've got to figure out a way, and we're helping them to do this in a way that's gentle, that is encouraging, that is supportive, that is patient, that is not just, if you don't get in there, because we, we know over time that's not going to work. That, that just does not work usually. For those of us who got sober, those of you who got sober in the militaristic model, got to be careful because it worked for you, it worked for people you know, but is, there's no guarantee that that Akhtung model of sobriety is going to work for everybody else. And I've seen that with some, with some of our clinicians out there where, hey, you know, I, you know, I quit smoking threw the pack out the cigarette in 1985, threw the, the cigarettes out of car window in 1985, haven't looked back. You know, no patch and nicoderm and, you know, uh, insurance programs to help me. Suck it up and just throw it away. Well, that's not going to work for everybody. So we have, we've got to, you know, just be mindful uh, of that. 